Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, look, firstly, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody this morning to our, our, our webinar. Uh, it's, I suppose, that time of year again when, I, I, I suppose, look, there's lots of questions from, from the industry and from farmers about, you know, plans for the year ahead. Um, it's, it's a beautiful morning this morning, so it's very spring-like. It's, it's lovely and sunny here in, in, in East Cork. Um, yesterday, on the other hand, I think we had about an inch and a half of rain. So it, it just, I suppose, it frames the fact that we're always dealing with the challenges that are presented by nature. Uh, but look, whether, whether I suppose it's, it's, it's unusual or not, we have a number of other challenges that are facing, uh, look, everybody in the industry this year. And okay, we had we had COVID scenarios for the last years, and we have a much bigger, I suppose, challenge now in terms of uh, difficulties with supply chains, um, huge inflationary costs on some of the inputs that are available, and and possibly scarcity of some of those inputs uh, in in terms of availability. And the industry is being encouraged to, to 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 you know to think of options and think of solutions to some of these problems. And look, while while the topic that we're talking about this morning, which is essentially looking at, at, you know, what can mainly, I suppose, a lot of what we talk about is what clover can offer in terms of white clover and red clover. Uh, but look, that was already what we were going to cover based on all the, 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 the climate change and, and concerns and biodiversity concerns that were there for the last, you know, the last number of years and the last many years, really. But it's actually much more relevant now in terms of maybe offering a solution to some of the other challenges that are out there. So I, I'm, look, I'm really delighted that you could join us. Um, just a couple of, I suppose, admin things. Uh, we welcome questions, any questions that people want to ask during, during the webinar. Um, the plan is that we'll finish at 12, so it'll be, it'll be one straight hour. Uh, use the question and answer function uh, for questions at the bottom of the screen, so not the chat function. So use the, the question and answer function, and I will then try and ask all the questions and, and, and ask the panelists for their opinion on those. Uh, just also, just to let everyone know that the webinar is recorded and the link, we'll send out the link to everybody probably later today. So that you, and look, the, the, the slides that, um, that'll be used during the webinar are also available. So I'm delighted this morning to say, look, we have, we have three people joining me, I suppose, to, to get the information across. Uh, firstly, we've Dr. James Humphreys, who's, who's uh, a Chagas researcher, who has done a huge amount of work in clover over the years, and he's he's you know particularly in the the Chagas Sola Head Farm in 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 is a Tipperary Tipperary Limerick border, so he he'll give us some information, and then look we'll be part of the discussion. Um, I'm delighted to have Kieran Murphy, a, a dairy farmer for Effin from Effin in County Limerick, who again has started looking at clover in the last number of years. Um, uh, Kieran will will take part in the discussion and look I I, I suppose when, when we start that discussion I'll give you a few more points of interest in relation to Kieran's experience and then I have my colleague Pat Cashpin Dr Pat Cashpin who will will look at a number of of areas in relation to the whole receding and the whole I suppose gold crop offering for the year ahead and will also give some information on the multi-species ward measure that's being being available from the Department of Agriculture this year so to start I'm going to ask uh, Dr. James Humphreys, uh, essentially to examine the benefits of white clover and red clover, and he has a presentation that uh, I suppose really frames a lot of the important points on this, and it's, it's it, the, the presentation is titled Developing a, Bru a Blueprint for Low Emission Dairy Farming. Now, I would say of all the people within, within the industry, um, I think James probably has more experience than anyone or certainly than most in relation to what Clover can do and the challenges with it. Um, and like I, I'd say just before you start even James, maybe just give us a flavor of, of the, 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 you know, the work that you've done over the years and how long you've been working on Clover. So with that, I'll hand over to you, James. Okay, um, thanks Dave. Um, I'll start to share my screen. Um, I started working on clover in the mid nineties. Um, and then in 2000, um, I came to Johnson, to Solihead. So I, I started out in Johnston Castle, but, um, <clears throat> and since then in Solihead, we've been working on um, at system scale, you know, dairy system scale with, with, typically we run dairy systems with around 32 cows per herd. So, We've around four systems running in Salahead. And we've been running at least a clover system at Salahead since 2000 now, which is over 20 years. So um, 
like you learn something from working from a component point of view, but running the systems really gives a a much closer or much more um, close to farming insight into into the running of these systems. And of course, it's we've been learning a lot during the years. So the what I'm going to talk about is the developing this blueprint for low emissions dairy farming. As as Dave said, the the, the climate change um, agenda is important, and and that that's the motivation for the work. But it's particularly relevant now um, with the very high cost of uh, nitrogen fertilizer. So the focus of the work at Salahed, um, this shows the typical greenhouse gas emissions uh, from an intensive dairy farm. The carbon footprint of around 1.05. And we can see the breakdown here between livestock emissions, which is really a numbers game, and other emissions and nitrogen fertilizer is a, is a big part of that. So we're more interested in, in cutting the emissions at this side of the line um, and with, with a focus on nitrogen fertilizer. To a lesser extent, we're looking at, um, say, the methane emissions here. I think that's a longer term objective and say emissions from, from excreta. So there are things we can do. Um, but look at the nitrogen in the things. Um, these are the systems we've been running. Um, high nitrogen system, pretty standard system. All of them are stocked at around two and a half cows per hectare with 32 cows per system, as I was saying. High nitrogen 275, it's close to the recommended nitrogen rate at, at that stocking rate. And you can see the level of production we've got over five years. Of course, we have the drought conditions here. Um, so I've excluded that from the mean. This system here we've been running for more or less, this has been our standard clover system for more or less um, 20 years. Uh, we've been improving productivity over the years because of, um, you know, we've learned how to manage things better over the years. And we were looking at the, the carbon footprint of that and we, I'll show that in a minute. And then we asked ourselves the question, what else can we do in terms of cutting the emissions? We weren't getting them down as, as much as we'd like. So for the last three years, we've been running the zero nitrogen system with, with no nitrogen fertilizer. And it's been working remarkably well. Um, and we're growing more or less the same amount of grass as where, as where we're putting on nitrogen. And really what we're seeing when we look at this data set and our longer term data set and other data sets is that for every kilo of nitrogen fertilizer we put on, we're reducing fixation by more or less the same amount. So there's a strong potential there to um, increase fixation. So the less fertilizer we use, the more the more we fix. And I think that's a particular relevance this year. When we look at the, uh, we scale the systems up to 50 hectare farm, taking the production we're getting. Now on the zero nitrogen system or our low carbon system, as we call it, we've, we've our highest EBI cows. We're taking the production data. This is the number of cows per farm. This is the carbon footprint per liter of milk. Now, bear in mind at the beginning, I showed that the average of intensive dairy farms is around 1.05. So we're seeing a good reduction here, even with our control system. Uh, it's a, it's a well-managed system, high EBI cows, higher EBI cows here, obviously, but um, you can see a reduction. And a large part of that reduction is coming from uh, lower nitrogen fertilizer use. We're also getting a reduction there in, in ammonia emissions. And you can see the the difference there compared to the national average percentage wise between the control here and the low carbon system it's around a 20 percent difference which is you know not not in substantial difference i suppose the big surprise for us is when we look at the net margins and i'll go into them in a small bit more detail in a minute but we ran the systems these two systems between 2000 and 2010 we looked at the profitability of it of them and we found no difference and of course, there wasn't a real strong incentive to adopt Clover on the basis of those figures. When we look at these figures now, say over five years, um, again, little or no difference, which ties in with other work in, in Moorpark and, and Clonakilty, for example, similar profitability with a much lower nitrogen input. I suppose what's very surprising is that when we look at the low nitrogen system, uh, it's working out more profitable. So if we look at the profit in a small bit more detail, again, the same figures, We've got uh, lower milk sales here because less cows. We've around 5% lower production. The higher 
EBI cows here compensate to some extent. And I suppose just to make the point with this low nitrogen system, we're, we're putting in all the best practices to lower the carbon footprint. Total sales then uh, reflecting cow numbers. When we look at the variable costs, um, the main part of reduction in variable cost there. Now this is using the average nitrogen fertilizer costs between 19, 20 and 21. Um, a difference there of around 12 or 13,000 between the high nitrogen system and the zero nitrogen system. And um, that's, the, that's the main difference. It's also the fact you have less cows, you have less uh, need to make silage, smaller need to make silage, less, less slurry to be handled. So there are other elements to that lower variable costs. Total fixed cost then, um, these figures will seem high compared to the profit monitor, for example, but we've fully costed in labor at 27 euros per cow uh, at 15 euro per hour. So there's, there's a big, there's about a 50,000 labor cost included there. So if you want to compare our net margins here to the profit monitor, you could add 50,000 back in, in terms of the labor cost because uh, labor isn't taken into account in the profit monitor. And that brings us down into the, the, the net margins that I've shown already. Now, if we factor in this year's uh, fertilizer nitrogen prices, which are, you know, double or more than double normal, uh, instead of the difference here of, of between um, 12 or 13,000, we see a difference of, of close to 30,000. So a substantial difference in um, 26,000 there of a difference in, 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 in net margin largely reflecting the, the higher fertilizer costs. So, uh, you know, there's a really strong incentive for farmers. If, if, if they have clover on the farm, maybe they've reseeded paddocks in recent years, with, you know, that contain some clover, bearing in mind that, that fertilizer nitrogen could be restricted in terms of availability later this year. There's a really strong incentive to target those paddocks, to try to develop the clover in them. The key part of developing the clover in them is, 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 is to cut back a nitrogen fertilizer. And the nitrogen fertilizer saved on those parts of the farm should be used where obviously where, the, where there's no clover. You get a much better response overall. So a key question, I suppose we, we don't really have time to go into this, how do you develop these highly productive clover swords? I think the first thing is more than clover content per se, you need a good distribution of clover across the paddock. I suppose if you think of a paddock being a hectare in size, that 10,000 square meters, how many of those square meters contain clover? And it's a plus or minus question. It's not how much clover they contain because clover content varies over the course of the year. It's a question in every square meter, is there clover, is there not clover? And if you're over 70%, if the answer you come up with is over 70%, you can easily develop that paddock on to be productive this year. P and K is, is crucial for this development and also high soil pH because key benefit of clover is nitrogen fixation. It's a biological process. You need to have your pH, you need to have your lime right. Needs, pH needs to be close to seven. And as I said, the less fertilizer nitrogen you use, the better. The more, the less you use, the more you'll fix. But it also impacts on the clover content. So when you start cutting out nitrogen fertilizer, it reduces competition in the swar between the grass and the clover and allows the clo clover to become more dominant. Tight grazing we see is crucially important four centimeters. We did a study, it's back more than about 15 years ago now where we grazed to six, five and four centimeters. And simply by going to six, in, to grazing to four compared to six centimeters, we increased production by 15% with no increase in inputs. Another thing we've looked at and we're currently looking at is low winter covers. Um, high covers, definitely damaging to clover swards. And then reseeding is part of the package that we, we have in Salahed. Now farmers coming into Salah had uh, what they're saying to us that they stocked at around three and a half cows, three, three and a half cows per hectare on the platform. Uh, they have out blocks. Um, so another thing that we're looking at, we're running one system this year, stocked at 3.3 cows per hectare on the platform, no nitrogen fertilizer. And then we're using red clover on out blocks. Now we've, we've been looking at this now for four years. So we're kind of four years into the cycle, but what I'm showing here is production data from Grange, where red clover with perennial ryegrass receiving no nitrogen was compared with perennial ryegrass receiving 600 kilos per hectare 
of fertilizer nitrogen in, and this is a multi-cut system, purely cutting silage off the out block. And you can see the production here, 2003, four, five, six, seven, very high production of the, the red clover swords compared to the ryegrass swords, close to 16 ton, averaged out, including the reseeding year at, at 15 tons. You'll also notice that there was a decline in the red clover content over time, and I think that's that, that's a feature of red clover. The swards are not persistent, and it's something that needs to be borne in mind. And I also have to say that it is exceptional that they managed to maintain high productivity over six years, but it really shows the potential of red clover. And this is something that we're hoping to, to replicate in Salahed, and including the reseeding years, as I said, averaging very similar yields to the very high nitrogen system. And, and there's a lot of interest, in my experience anyway, out on farms in this idea where intensive dairy farmers highly stocked on the platform will probably try to carry on as they are on the platform, but in terms of cutting nitrogen fertilizer are putting red clover in on, on out blocks. So just to kind of just say something about that, uh, red clover can be highly productive in a multi-cut system. Cost effectiveness depends on longevity, and I guess there's some work needs to be done around that because we don't have a lot of experience with red clover in this country. Zero fertilizer nitrogen, definitely. Uh, there's no benefit in putting nitrogen fertilizer onto red clover swords. In fact, it does more harm than good. Maintaining high K levels, there's very high levels of K offtake with, with red clover, so you have to maintain your K or else the sward will die out. Avoiding damage is important, and we're very cognizant of that now in Salahed in terms of spreading slurry this time of the year and uh, when we're going into harvest. Post emergence dock control is very important, and lime, as I said already, uh, because that will fix maximize fixation. And like I think lime is going to be particularly important this year because um, it doesn't cost any more this year than than. Other years, you know, everything else has gone up. Nitrogen has gone up, P and K has gone up, but but lime is still the same. So we have to make maximum use of lime this year. So that's that's my my introduction, uh, Dave. Um, I don't want to go on to too long, but and back to you. Yeah, yeah. Look, that's that that's great, James. Um, to be fair, I suppose you've given a huge amount of information in eight or nine slides there. That um, I, I, I suppose. It, 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 it probably frames what can be achieved with clover, but I, I, I guess as an industry, look, the, the, those high levels of clover on farm are not normal. And, um, you know, there's a lot of farmers will certainly, you know, be considering what the options are now um, and maybe look to, to kind of tease into it a little bit more. What I do now is I'll, I'll bring uh, Kieran, Kieran Murphy into the discussion as well. And so Kieran is, is, as I say, is a farmer in, in Effin and County Limerick, a dairy farmer. He has, he started looking at clover really three years ago. Um, and I think there's 40% of the farm now with a reasonable level of clover. And, uh, and again, look, he, he's, he's considering the red clover silage sward system as well. So maybe just to start off, Kieran, maybe just give us a kind of a, 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 a your own ideas on clover or why you why you why you made the decision to start looking at clover on the farm and look what, what what you found really in the last two or three years yeah sure look i suppose probably started looking at it for the same reason as anyone else i think it's uh in time where it's a roof we're gonna we're gonna have to go down to reduce our reliance on in or an artificial in so I suppose look, that's the main reason. Um as it I suppose look as it came, just we took on land there in 2018 and had a lot of receding to do. So that's how we've ended up with no clover to 40% in a few years. But um yeah, sure. Look, I suppose we've kind of dabbled a bit so far last year in particular. In starting to pull back nitrogen a bit and look at I suppose looking at James's slides and like he's saying there about um for every kilo of in that is a kilo of whatever synthesized in that you're replacing. So I suppose that's kind of our next step really is to actually try and I suppose put a bit more faith in it like that and really try and get a bit more out of it by actually cutting back more on, on the artificial side. 
right? Um, and look, that's, I suppose, that, that, that's the, the, the question, I suppose, that a lot of people will wonder, how do you get confidence to do that? Um, so, look, just uh, maybe a couple of the areas maybe that, 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 are, that, that are really, can, you know, I suppose, needing answers really, and, and maybe James, just in terms of, of you know, we'll say if you take a, a, a commercial dairy farmer, who has, is, is probably the norm that has little enough clover on farm uh, up to now, has, has probably bought many mixtures over the years with a half kilo of clover in them and didn't manage it really in any way to facilitate the clover and ended up with a sprinkling of clover across the farm and didn't really take any notice of it. And maybe at some stage then sprayed it out when he was spraying docks. Like what, what advice would you give to that to, to a farmer in that position now with, with what clover can do i suppose to some of the, the problems we have at the moment so if, if we take a uh, kieran's situation there with, with say 40 percent of the farm contains clover of, of variable amounts we we don't know to go out what i be saying is to go out and make an assessment of the clover that's there. Now, if, if we take white clover, which is the key, um, you go from a situation in April where you could have maybe 10 or 15% clover in the sward, and then you go to August where you can have the sward awash with clover. It could look like there's more clover than anything else in the sward. But like the key question is right now, so instead of actually looking at contents per se what i'd be saying is look at distribution imagine a paddock in terms of ten thousand square meters how many of those square meters contain clover so what i'll do when i'm doing the pasture cover i walk across the paddock every step i take i'm counting am i seeing clover or not so if you've above 70 percent clover if you have a distribution in that order i would say management alone will get it up to where you'd want it to be if you're between say 40% and 70% distribution, I would say over sowing then has a role where you can top up the clover by over sowing, just over sowing the white clover seed in, in on the sward. If you're less than 30% or if you've no clover at all, you really need to be thinking about reseeding. And in terms of over sowing and reseeding, I would say put a limit of 10 to 15% to the farm. I would say normally 10%, but the year that's in it, you might over sow a bit more if you know, if, if fertilizer supplies are tight. But if, if you take that scenario, take care in scenario, say 40% of the farm and it determines that it's, it can be either managed up or it could be oversown. Like there's a big saving in nitrogen fertilizer there. That nitrogen fertilizer then could go on the parts of the farm where there's no clover. And if we take it, and it seems likely that 60, we, we, we might only be able to get access to maybe 60, 70% of the, our normal nitrogen supply you're far better off to focus that on the paddocks with no clover and even paddocks that are poor enough from a clover point of view by not applying nitrogen on them they'll improve but they'll also grow more relatively speaking so if you take an overall farm situation getting the fixation working on the clover paddocks will will increase overall productivity rather than putting nitrogen evenly over the whole farm does that make sense absolutely yeah um, and, and Kieran, I, I, I turn over to you now. Um, okay, you, you, you again. You started establishing clover three years ago. What methods did you use? At, like, it, in, and in terms of receding, what sort of kilos of clover went out? Um, actually, how? What, what, what was it? Plowing, receding, or what method was? Yeah. It? So look, all that was all of that was yeah, sprayed off, plowed, um, tilled, um. Yeah, that was all ploughed and tilled. Um, I suppose all of that, or most of that ground would have gone in. There was a half kilo in the bag, and sure, probably ended up being so on around 0.7 kilos per acre of clover seed. But um, yeah, sure, look, still got, I suppose, have reasonable levels of establishment still after that. Um, so yeah, P and K and lime are good on all of that ground. Um, would have got a good like, look got a three to four bags of 10, 10, 20 an acre as well at receding. Um, tried over sawing last year. I would say probably like that. Um, I think I'd be leaning more towards more receding. 
as a means of establishing more of it going forward, like um just for our for ourselves here anyway, that we have, I suppose underproductive headaches that need to be receded anyway. So I think it's um yeah, I taking I think taking another couple of acres out to reseed as opposed to taking a couple of acres out to so for us anyway would make would be more beneficial. But um and just a question then you would say with those swords that, that were sown with clover, did you manage them any differently to, to the other paddocks on the farm in the last three years? To be honest, uh, like what was done in so the first of it would have been received in 19, and in the first two years, the answer would be no, not really. Like, um, the ewes were just trying to graze them out tight, and they wouldn't have wouldn't have held back in nitrogen at all. No? But, um yeah, sure. I suppose last year then, yeah, look, mid-season last year, he did pull back on nitrogen, like, not completely, like, but instead of going with a unit per day, pull back to half unit per day. And, and we, like, what are your plans for the year ahead then, Kieran, in relation to nitrogen application for those fields? Um, I suppose, to be straight, like, part of it will depend on how brave we're feeling <laughs> when April and May come. But look, the plan would be definitely some of that ground to, I suppose, look where the, the base clover is to cut out completely. Um, I suppose I have a bit of O1020 got just for that purpose to, to go with that every second round or possibly power washings um, just to keep a bit of P&K into it. But yeah, look, that's, I suppose, we'll... <laughs> Just uh, dip our toe another beat with part of it. I'm not, I don't think I'd see myself pulling out completely across 40% of the platform, like, just yet. And, and James, can, can I just turn that, that, that discussion over to you? Like, what would you say to people? And again, look, you, you've shown us the trial work and you've, you've observed all that trial work. It, you know, you're, you're, you're doing it on the farm that, that um, I suppose that you're very, very familiar with. What would you say to give people confidence in, in reducing in, in, in the amount of nitrogen that they're putting out? Yeah, so, so we've, we've um, like in, in Kieran's case, the, f the first thing uh, that will happen is, is um, like if, if you have a paddock that's used to getting nitrogen, just like everything else, when you stop applying nitrogen, obviously there's going to be Bit of setback to fix nitrogen. So if it's getting nitrogen all along, it just doesn't have that machinery, if you know what I mean. It's like a guy sitting watching telly all Christmas, all winter, and then you ask, ask him to go to play a match. He won't be ready if he's not, he's not match ready. And it's a bit like that with the clover. They're not fit for action if they've been getting nitrogen all along. And I think that's one thing we see with the zero nitrogen. Obviously, we're going to have slower growth at this time of the year. But when we look at annual production, we get the same annual production because that clover is ready to work when, when, when the soil temperatures start to rise. But in terms of getting confidence, um, <clears throat> what I find very good is, is say to a farmer, maybe put in a reseed. And in our case, what we'd recommend is put in two kilos of red clover and two kilos of white clover. A red clover in the grazing mix is unusual, but if you really want to, to get a good kickoff with, with the reseed, uh, having the rate over in there can give a good boost for the first couple of years. And what we'd say to people is put no nitrogen onto that, put on maybe two bags of Tintin 20 after reseeding and put no nitrogen on that for the rest of the year. And I'd be very confident in saying to anybody, once the PNK is right, lime is right, that, that paddock will perform very well. And we've experience of that with farmers as well. So. I'd be very confident about saying that. So if, if, if somebody wanted to dip their toe in, that's a very good way to do with reseed because you know exactly what you're dealing with. Taking the year that's in, that's I think what Kieran is doing is, is, is right. Maybe pick his very best clover paddocks. They're the first ones to, to try out in terms of st stopping nitrogen because it is a big leap of faith. And I suppose I've gone beyond that. Maybe I'm... I'm Maybe a bit extreme from that point of view, but um, you know, definitely try it on a couple of paddocks and uh, 
I'd be confident that that'll work out. Um, lads, I, I, I just I have a number of questions after coming in there now, and we just we, we'll just address them. Um, a question there: What cost of nitrogen is calculated in those margin figures, James? So uh, the first set I showed were, was the average cost for 2019 to 21, and uh, so took them off the CSO figures. They cost in to be very similar to what what they actually cost us in Solihead. The cost in this year, um, I just got quotes from the local dairy gold supplier for urea and and can and protected urea. So um, <clears throat> the I think the can was something like seven hundred euro per ton, and the urea was coming in at nine hundred. Uh, 900 950 euro per ton so that that, that they're the type of figures i used just for the 2022 figures absolutely and, and look while those those costs are are, are extreme and an extreme rise compared to the last couple of years the reality is that um i'm not so sure if fertilizer can be bought at those figures even now because things have changed so quickly another question there is the low winter covers being better? Is that a side effect of later grazing and less poaching? Is a question. Um, look, we, it's we're actually really testing this in a controlled way this year, and I, I don't want to say too much. Like we've done some work on this before, we found that where you have a low winter cover, you clover. Will will be in a much stronger position in the spring. And of course, if you have more clover in the spring, more fixation than during the following year. And we actually found increased fixation by a rent, which is this huge potential with this. Of course, there's a trade-off then in terms of, um, you know, turn out, the, turn out the grass in the spring and that sort of thing. But like this year, we've had excellent winter growth. We closed up our low covers at, at around 350. We closed up the high cover winter covers at 800 in December, 1st of December. Um, like really we're a wash of grass now with those high cover systems and we're struggling to get through them. And um, you can see, and look, we have to do a proper assessment of it, but you can see, I'd, I'd say maybe 30% of our swards have been seriously damaged by the very high covers, covers of over a thousand there during the winter. So I think there is a lesson there. I know I'm maybe talking about a bit too soon before we've been fully evaluated, but yeah. I. I the, the, the other side of that question then is how do you manage grass in the spring if you close up with a low winter cover and start with a low low enough spring cover and um, you know we're getting really good clean outs with the low covers and that sort of thing so it's, it's not as problematical as you might think um, it's far more difficult than we found it last year as well we've run the trial this is our second year doing it on a much more difficult to manage the high covers than the low covers in the spring yeah. in terms of getting them grazed out now that's down to the weather as well like Last year we got a very this year now, and I'm jumping to go into small bit talking about that. Uh, another question for you, James: uh, What kilos per hectare of P and K are needed to maintain high clover swards based on index two soils? Based on index two soils. I wouldn't have those figures in my head, but what we're looking at in soil ahead is. We've been looking at leaching, K leaching, and we're looking at input output balances. So, roughly speaking, I would think at uh, an index three, um, we're looking at maybe 20 to 25 units per year in K. That we need to have that going into the system. Uh, as Kieran was saying, there maybe half a bag of 0730 every second grazing we find to be um, to be good. If you go down to index two, and like I'd probably stick with that this year with the with the price of K as it is. I think if you're feeding a certain amount of K into the system, um, you know, I, I like the cost of K, and I, I don't have a figure on it right now, but as a rule of thumb, on the grazing platform, about 25 kilos of K evenly spread over the year. For red clover swords, then it's a different scenario. And a red clover swords will mine all the K out of the ground. And in that case, for every ton of dry matter that you expect to take off, say if you, you expect a five ton crop of first cut silage off red clover, I'd be putting on um, 25 kilos of K and three kilos of P. 
So that can go on then either as slurry or as uh, fertilizer. So for if we were to take off a five ton crop, we'd need to put in 125 kilos or 100 units per acre of K and 12 units per acre of P. And likewise in for every subsequent cut. Like it's a very bad practice, particularly in red clover silage swords and out blocks to try to put all your K on at once because the first cut will just soak up as much as it can carry and, and it won't leave it there. So okay. we'd fertilize before. Every crop, the red clover will just mine out all the K. The risk with saying that, of course, is milk fever. Just, just to be conscious of that. Um, okay, no, getting that, 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 that's, that's, a, that's a very, a very relevant point in terms of, of particularly K. If, if it's going to be taken up in a luxury way and, 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 and not left there for the next crop, that's very important. Just, I, I, and I suppose there's a couple of real challenges that farmers will have in their, their heads, whether in, in, in whatever experience they may have of clover from the past. But in terms of, of spring growth, Kieran, how, how have you, like, how have you, how, how have you found the level of spring growth that you're getting in the clover swords versus the, the, the rest of the farm? Um, I suppose probably not a fair comparison because they're relative, like, I suppose, they're all relatively new races compared to the rest of the farm. So look, I would say quite good anyway. Um, I forget exactly when it was, but just we were over in solid with a group there last, the end of last year. And I suppose was listening to what James was saying like that about closing up at lower covers. So I suppose I did that. And sure, look, I'd be kind of agreeing with the, would have always kind of been of the opinion, look, on this farm would be, relatively heavy I suppose and um, there's a lot to be said for the lighter covers for utilization in the spring anyway to get the good clean out um I suppose rather than having it there but leaving it after you so okay. it's not I something that I'd be too concerned about anyway okay and I think you covered that question already James in, in, in your last answer the next one, and I suppose it's it's one that crops up for most people, and it's bloat, and the, the the risk of bloat or the challenge in managing bloat on the farm. I just like to get both of your opinions or experiences, and I might start with you, James, and like what again to that commercial farmer who might be considering getting a higher level of clover on the farm. What, what advice would you give to him in terms of bloat? So the the, the real risk, if we take a farmer say he's got thirty percent clover and seventy percent not clover. The, and starts to work on the clover this year in terms of developing the contents and everything else. And I mean, getting up to high contents, the big risk then is if you're moving cows from a no clover situation to a high clover situation, you need to manage that a lot more carefully. Now, just to put the situation in, in solid head in context, 20 years, we never had a case of bloat. And what we always put that down to was um, the fact that the cows in our system, they go on to a clover system and they stay on the clover system for the year. We're not moving them back and forth and then um it was 20 odd time we lost three cows out of the blue and i think part of that was bearing in mind the time of year that we had taken our eye off the ball in terms of management to some extent because you can manage you can manage bloat uh, on the back of that we started using bloat oil and i costed that into the numbers that i showed earlier on um, and it's a substantial enough cost. And that's something we're, that we're looking at to see, can we avoid that cost because uh, oils and everything else have gone up this year again. So it's something that we can manage. But I think things like using a, a milking strip, you know, the, the thing with clover is it grows a bit like an umbrella. So when you have a very high clover content, it looks like there's all clover. The cows can go in and just whip up all that clover leaf. And that's when there's a real risk of bloat. But if you can force cows to graze down into the base of the sward, to get more of the fiber at the base of the sward, you, you can largely avoid blood. What we're doing in October now, just last October, you know, as soon as grass is getting scarce, we put the cows in for one night every 48 hours. So they get a feed of silage every 48 hours, and that seems to be able to keep blood under control as well. So I suppose the point to make is you can't dismiss blood. It is a real risk, and when, you ha when it happens, it's a real you know, if you lose three cows or lose more cows, that's a real disaster. But I think it is manageable. Um, and just, just to be aware of the risk. Okay. 
and, and Kieran, just any what experiences have you had with it, or have you had problems with blow? Yeah, well, look, I suppose so far so good. I mean, I don't think we're at, at that high levels of over yet that it is as much of a risk, but I would say probably also just because the farm, I suppose, is a bit fragmented and where most of the clover is, we're, we're either crossing the road to a quarter of the farm and we're walking up as nearly two kilometres to, to more of it. So we're on pretty much all 12 hour breaks anyway, for that reason. So I suppose that probably mitigates some of it as well. Okay. Okay. Um. I just want to kind of change the focus a bit more over onto the white clover silage because again, while lots of people have had the experience of white clover and grazing clover at some level on the farm, the, the red clover experience probably to date is probably very much on organic farmers maybe. Um, and while there was significant trial work done, but particularly in Grange many years ago, and I know I, I'd spoken to Patrick O'Kiley back, back maybe 10, 15 years ago, and he was very confident that it had a significant place on normal commercial farms. And it's kind of just like what you outline, James, in that sort of system and the kind of yields that are possible. But again, it, it, this is one, again, that people need confidence with. So um, James, like based on what you showed us and the, the, the bar charts you showed us, it's extremely productive and it can be a significant saver of nitrogen fertilizer. So again, what advice do you have to someone just considering it? Yeah, I, I suppose the, 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 the concern I have is it's like anything that's new, it's wonderful until people kind of get to see, you know, it's it's not all like the, I think the real big risk with, with red clover is how persistent it will be. Um, like it's massively productive. I think if you, I think a key thing for me is um, making sure that your P and K levels, that you're, you're putting back in as much K in particular that you're taking off. I think that that is big influence on longevity. Like we swords and Salah had now averaging 15 tons over the last four years. You're very happy with it uh, from that point of view. The question is, you know, we have to do a full evaluation on it. How long will it last? And that will have a big bearing then on how cost effective it is. Um, so it, in our particular case it was ground that we got temporarily. So we put in red clover with a hybrid mix. So we weren't expecting it to last too long, so but we're very happy with it so far. Okay. And I think big potential. Okay. Uh, there's a few questions on that red clover area, so I'll just I'll just ask them to you, James. Um, so what's everyone's thoughts on establishing red a red clover sword without plowing? So just burning off, stitching in the seed, and also any comments on dock control in clover in clover swords. Um, what we're sorry, Dave. I you, I missed you there for a minute. Yes, yeah, so I am. Um, was there for a second. Could you okay, uh, just establishing uh, red clover swords without plowing. So you just burn it off and stitching in the seed, and then any comments on dot control. So what we're doing in Salahed is we burn off and we disk it on plow because we don't have the depth of soil, topsoil, and. Um, I guess that's not the same thing as what they're talking about, but we just disc and then with two runs of a power arrow, put it in with the second run, and I suppose our seed beds will be fluffy enough. I think dock control is absolutely vital uh, with red clover swords because all of the things that suit red clover also suit docks. And if you talk about why a red clover sword can fail, I said potassium already, that's a key one. Docks is probably number two. Okay. So <clears throat> there is a problem with the availability of, of post emergence herbicides. Uh, they were available last year under a derogation. I think they're they're going to be available again this year under a derogation. But absolutely, don't miss the opportunity to to put on um to put on the the post merger herbicide at at the right time. Um, you know, which is just just making sure that the clover is well enough developed in terms of the trifoliate leaves that you have three or four sets of trifoliate leaves on the, on the red clover plant, and that the docks aren't gone too strong. And and you could say to me, well, could you not give me a time on that? Is it six weeks? Is it eight weeks? That can vary an awful lot. Like if you take last April, for example, we got very cold conditions. I think it was nearly 10, 10 weeks before we put on the post-emergence herbicide. During a summer seed, you might put it on after six. So it's just a case of making sure that the clover is well enough developed that the spray doesn't kill it. Okay. 
And hopefully, I can't say for sure, but hopefully the, those sprays will be available again this year. Yeah, I like might throw in there actually that we, we have seen circumstances where uh, in a plowed sward that's very soft and very easy to do damage with heavy silage equipment that the, the low tillage systems seem to actually preference the rate lower because the seed bed isn't near as soft when you come into silage that in 18 weeks after 18, 12, 16 weeks after sowing that even the following year after plowing heavy silage trailers or, sil or balers, they seem to do an awful lot of damage to, to red clover. Like, and with a min till system, that doesn't seem to be as pronounced as was well. like there's a bit more structure there in the soil. Like, so it might be something to, to be aware of that. You know. yes. Another question there, what's the best time of year to do a full reseed for red clover? And this would be purely for bale silage production for a beef fattening system. So James, I suppose you might take that one again. Well, I, I guess uh, I guess we're talking about out blocks and uh, practically speaking, you could reseed in April, which is what we did. But if you have a crop there already, you might try to get the first cut off it and then reseed. You know, it, it, you know, the, I don't. I think you could reseed any time from the beginning of April through to the end of August. Um, I wouldn't have any great worry about that. Um, but like, if you, you know, it, it'll depend an awful lot on the circumstances whether or not you want to get off that first cut or not. That would be the consideration in my mind. I would tend to go for the first cut and then reseed afterwards. You know, just let take the cut, let it green up a bit, spray it off, and and reseed. Perfect. Uh, another question on red clover. Um, uh, uh, what's what type of lifespan has a red clover silage ward and how effective are, are the disease resistant red clover varieties and when it's time to recede the, the, the when do you when do you recede the red clover sward again or is there is there a rotational requirement so of active there, there is a rotational requirement and i think that's something to be to bear in mind i think the risks with it at, at the present time are probably relatively low but it is something to bear in mind so one, one of the ways you could do that is maybe put in red clover with a hybrid, hopefully get what, five, six years out of it, and then maybe go in with maize for a couple of years as a break. What we're trying to do in Salahed, and it's still very much um, not proven, we we'll say, but it's, it's reasonable, is, is we're putting in red clover, white clover, and perennial ryegrasses. And what we expect is that the red clover will progressively die out of the sward, as I've shown already with the work from range where the red clover contents were declining. Yields were maintained, but the red clover contents were declining. And that you'll get a progressive replacement of the red clover by white clover. So that by the end, we, we'd hope the swards will last 10 years in a cutting situation. By the time we come to the end of the cycle, there won't be much red clover left in the sward, but it'll be a white clover dominated sward. If that makes sense. Okay. And we're hoping that portion of it will act as the, the disease break. Bearing in mind that the incidences of the two main diseases that are a concern, and we have to be concerned about them. It's, it's like the bloat, we certainly can't ignore it, but the risks of those are relatively low at the present time. I think it's only when red clover becomes more prevalent, if it becomes more prevalent in the country. And that, that's what happened in Denmark, where red clover kind of went out of the system in the 50s and in the 60s and the 70s. Then they introduced the nitrates directive at, in the late 90s. And there was a resurgence then in the use of red clover in Denmark. And these diseases then started to show up in the mid 2000s. And the diseases I'm talking about are stim eelworm and uh, sclerotinia fungus. Okay. So a break can control it. So I, I'd be factoring that break into my thinking if I was thinking about red clover. Okay. Just, just uh, in, in terms of the red clover silage option, Kieran. And I know, look, you, you're considering it and you're looking at it. Like, are you likely to go ahead with that this year? And like, what, like based on even what, what, what James had this morning, like, do, do you see it having a significant place on the farm? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, uh, look, we're definitely going to go ahead with, with some of it. Um, sure, look, I think, again, um, as a means of even keeping some more nitrogen probably for the platform. Um, but as well, the, the quality of silage there to have that you can bail it and keep it separate. Um, I suppose like that my only the concerns about it would be um 
even on some heavier oak ground, like trying to mind it. Again, like we were talking about heavy machinery or even trying to get in there in the spring. That I suppose that would be a bit of a concern with it. But yeah, look, we're definitely going to try some of it. James, a question for you. How is red clover, how is it to preserve? Um, and then he's, he's saying, look, mown with or without a conditioner more, and should it, should an additive be used? Um, I, I'll leave it all those. I'll just follow up with Kieran's there. One of the things with, solid is heavy enough. One of the things with red clover on the outblock on heavier ground is that you're really only going in with machinery when things are relatively drier. Like you don't really need to go in with slurry, say, until um, March. You know, so it, it kind of, I wouldn't dismiss it on wet ground because I think you can manage it. Mm. It's really October, November, you might have concerns. Like what we find is very heavy covers of grass in, in October, November, and you have to take them out freely. And we've used a zero grazer uh, for that purpose. But I, I think if you leave it over the winter, it'll just rot. Now, the thing about making silage off red clover is... Um, like our own results would show, and, and I think the results from Grange would say the same, is, is relative to a perennial ryegrass ward or a hybrid ryegrass ward, um, pure sward, the red clover um, isn't as good. And it's more difficult to preserve. So th th there's more care there. And in our case, uh, we, we'd normally put in a 48-hour wilt. So we will keep an eye on the weather forecast and, and we'll wilt it. And we make we'd say very acceptable silage, low 70s, DMDs, good group protein and everything else. No real problem with the preservation. Um, but you do need the wilt. And if the wilt wasn't an option for whatever reason, we'd probably be talking about using molasses or something as a, as a preservative. But definitely, there's no question that it's, it's, it's uh, not as easy to ensile. And do you spread it out for that wilt? Do you it? Do you toss it out for that wilt, James? Oh yeah, yeah. We'd we'd spread we'd we'd cut it, spread it out, leave it down for the forty eight hours, uh, okay. load it, and bail it up. Um, and uh, like when you look at the numbers, and like we've been doing this for a number of years before we actually looked at the numbers in terms of its preservation characteristics, in terms of buffering capacity and uh, water soluble carbohydrates. If you looked at the, you'd say, geez, this is this is very difficult to to, to ensile. But I wouldn't let that put me off based on our experience. We we've no difficulty ensiling it. And like you could also the our experience is very high intake characteristics. That the cows really go mad for it. Like they they'll go for that before they'll go for normal normal yeah. silage. And um, lads, what I want to do now is it's something different. Okay, and I, am, I think we've covered a lot of the questions that people might have on white clover and red clover. Um, I want to bring Pat Cashman in now and, and, and just, I suppose, discuss, um, look, from, I suppose from Goldcroft's point of view, what's very important is look, the, the decisions people make around receding and whether to do it or not. And look, it's our job then to have the required seeds that people want, whether it's red clover, white clover, perennial regress, whatever it is. But, Pat is just going to give us some some info on like cost benefit of receding, you know, in the in the year ahead, and maybe with some of the change circumstances that we're all that we're all facing at the moment. So over to you, Pat. Yeah, there are some more questions there, so we're going to run tight on time. But I think we can record those questions and probably contact people directly afterwards. It's just I said there's an awful lot of questions there on right over, and understandably so. So, look, I suppose the big one that's floating around at the moment is the cost benefit of receding. You know, a lot of receding done last year, and look. Will it pay to do receive this year if inputs are tight? Um, all inputs are basically up um, in cost. So, like, does it pay? Is, is this year to take a, a holiday from receiving? So, like, what I pulled up here is the cost of feed wheat from the HDB website from this morning. So it gives a kind of idea of projected feed costs. So I suppose what we're saying, if you have an underperforming paddock on the farm, maybe a paddock growing ten tons of grass, which would be kind of maybe the in the, the national average, if you need that feed to feed cows um, and you can't grow it on your own farm, you're going to have to buy that in and look, I suppose, feed wheat kind of compares favorably on an energy basis per ton with, with grazed grass. Like, so you're looking there, this is pounds. So you're looking at about 350 euros a ton 
Um, if you're just buying straight wheat, and look, you can put a premium on, on that if it's going to be dairy ration that you're going to be buying in. Like, so like I suppose not producing the feed at home doesn't leave you off the hook. Um, if there's potential there to grow more by receiving like, and so I suppose this is the cost. And look, they're quite real costs. I suppose whether you want to take it, the cost of including um the, the just the machinery part or look some of the maintenance part which should be the lime and fertilizer as well like but look you're, if you were to take it all in on the worst case scenario from look these are subject to change i suppose but you're looking at 400 euros uh an acre but look based on a, a wheat price of 350 euros a ton um look you growing an extra three ton per hectare would cost and i suppose it's not just between growing this year it's growing what you can grow up until magic day next april um because look you don't you don't get out of next winter until you hit magic day like so potential there putting in maybe um look there's potential from what james is saying in that reseed an in saving a nitrogen saving would that nitrogen being diverted to other parts of the farm where there isn't clover and um, that spring growth that will come in I say next spring, because being able to get out next winter will it will be advantageous and having to fill that gap. And then there's a feed quality, you know, being able to have a higher end performance. So I don't do do Kieran and James want to jump in there. Like, what are their thoughts on whether we, this is the year to to skip receiving or not? Yeah, Kieran, maybe uh, can you give us your thoughts on it? Yeah, sure. Look, um, I say I suppose in our own scenario here. We have a share of ground that look, we didn't do much receding for a long time. There's, if there's still going to be a benefit in terms of quality and grow out there for us in receding that. Um, and sure, look, not, that, not really based on any evidence or anything like but I mean, how long do you wait for? Do you know, is there a guarantee it's going to be better next year? So I'd say no, it'll be continuing as normal anyway. And, and James, what, what, what would you <coughs> And, and kind of people's receding plans for the year ahead? So I, I guess um, in our case, we, we kind of plan to do 10%, so we'll, that's what we'll do. Like, it's a really big question. Like, if, if, you, if you reseed, you're, you're taking ground out of production for three months, effectively. So if you burn off now, say, 10th of April, just to show a date there, it might be the end of June before you're back in grazing, so that, the, the, you know, you're losing that production, I guess. When when we look at it, uh, um, bearing in mind we get grazing off in the spring, and then look at the production we get subsequent to the reseeding, we reckon we lose around two tons in the year. So we could still grow a, a thirteen ton crop off that paddock. Now, if 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 you're replacing a very poor paddock, you might be even growing that amount in the first place. So they're the type of things that you'd have to consider, you know. Um, as I said, we, we, we'll progress with reseeding again this year. Um, it's part of our system. Any any other comments on that, Pat? Well, I better move on because I'll be killed for being late. Yeah, but so look, Pat just, has got cover. Just on the, mix, on, on the mixtures, I pulled all these screen grabs off the Gold Crop website, so I expected that we didn't end up being uh, immersed in conversation and uh, we would run short on time. So look, everything here is on the website, um, but I'll just run through just to direct you. Um, so the first one here is, um, this would have been sown in solid hedge one or, one or two years. And this was what James is recommending, 10 kilos of ryegrass. So varieties with good graze out, good spring growth to fill maybe some of that um, gap there for, in the spring, but putting in two kilos of red clover, two kilos of white clover. And look, I think there's something in the questions, but like I said, I think James covered it, that the red clover is there to give that establishment benefit from a nitrogen perspective, like, and then you have a good solid level of clover. And look, I think we're saying two kilos here, but look, Kieran has got good results of putting in 0.7. So like, I think it highlights the bent, the, the importance of, of establishment um, methods and management afterwards it's not just down to, to the seeding rate the second thing is your red clover silage so look seven kilos of ryegrass four kilos of red clover so red clover seed is much bigger and then a kilo of large leaf white clover to fill in then as the as the and look there's a question about it and james covered it we'd expect that to last eight nine ten years and building the rotation in where that red that ryegrass and white clover persist on past the um 
and that range work would have shown a considerable in loading on the soil that lasted even after the red clover died, died out. Um, the other thing would be the main grazing mix that we would we would do, and we still see it you know, to be a, you know, maybe more mainstream. Um, we don't see that everyone will want to maybe go to very high levels of clover. But look, I think that, look, you've got your varieties with high digestibility, high spring growth, um, high graze out, so all the varieties in this so this mixture will be somewhere averaging four stars on the graze out like so we see this has been very important for clover establishment to be able to get this good graze out and look here and i, I won't pull you in now but you were so a good bit of this mixture like um over the last few years um and that was the big change this year is that we put aston conqueror in and we have the confidence now to put in maybe higher ppi diplides that are coming for the intermediate category because we have proof that they have good graze out um coming from the the job is trialing. Um, I suppose the the last thing that I'll mention, and I know we put it on the agenda, and I know it's not announced, so I don't want to speak out of turn here, but look, the department have indicated in the budget last year that they will be funding there for 20,000 acres of multi-species sward mix, and that measure is in its final stages, and it's to be announced in the next number of week to 10 days. So look, the, the, the idea here is that there'd be a subsidy would be issued through the trade. So that when you, when you so I suppose to go through in, in order is that this, the system, the, the, the measure will be announced. The platform will be open for farmers to apply. Um, it'll be open for three weeks. Assuming this, this it isn't oversubscribed, the farmer will then get um, a letter of proof that he is accepted into the scheme. He can take the, he work in conjunction with, with his um, retailer then, or he or she, his or her retailer to work um, a, the 50 euro um, subsidy for that mixture. So look at me, cost wise, it's going to be quite attractive. You've got a mixture here with three kilos of clover, 1.7 kilos of herb, and um, it'll come in cheaper than your, your standard mix with three quarters of a half or three quarters of a kilo of clover. Like, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be attractive in a year where nitrogen is, is expensive. So look, that's there. I think it, it's probably can't, David can't say too much more about it because it's, it, look, it's the department scheme and it's, it's to them to announce it before we speak out of turn on it. But um, our understanding anyway, is that that will go live in the next couple of days. Yeah, look at Pat, and I think that 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 that's that's what's expected. Yeah, sometime in the next few days it, it'll go live. I thought so, yeah, one or two. Yeah, I just I also put in look, I suppose people are looking maybe again are afraid of the right clover. I suppose we put in an air mix with a kilo and a half of white clover. And I suppose we picked out all the varieties with the highest spring growth. So we want to see could you fill that spring gap by putting in varieties with, with very high spring growth. Um and then I suppose I put in one last thing. We put up a, a, a section on the website there last night is, look, we, we expect that this is going to be quite a, maybe a difficult transition for some people. And, and you can see by the questions, and we'll try to get back to them, that there is a huge amount of uh, you know, draw there for more information. So we put up a, a section there on the website where if you have a group that you can book, book one of the Gold Crop staff to come out and, and maybe discuss this because the webinars are all well and good, but and um, so the real advantage is to be able to maybe see something on the ground so that that's there and i'll 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 cut out at that point just one i, I suppose one thing to add on that and i know i was talking to james about this earlier but solar head farm is again it's it's a working farm with all this work going on and it's all there to be seen so james i think you're happy for groups to come and visit um once they book it in with you yeah absolutely um i think um I could talk all day here, but when you actually see it on the ground in Salah, that's that's the that's the real convincing thing. So, like, we're taking groups all the time, so we're we're, we're glad. Just just email me or just give me a ring. You'll find my my email address on the easily there on the website. Yeah, thanks, James. And I know, look, I I would I would advise anyone who 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 is interested in that to go and do it because the, 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 it's, the, there's great feedback from anyone who's visited um, um, and look, it, it's real practical information. So look, uh, the, the hour has passed, then we're just gone slightly over time. Um, and look, 
I think there was a lot of very valuable information discussed and a lot of, of, of good information put out there. Um, but there's plenty more available. So from our own point of view in Goldcrop, again, the Goldcrop uh, website, goldcrop.ie, has lots of the information we've discussed uh, uh, available um, with the click of, of a, a few buttons. Um, and also you can contact myself, Dave Barry, or Pat Cashman directly, no problem whatsoever, or any of our, our salespeople around the countryside. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, gold crop, obviously, look, grass seeds is a hugely important area for us, but we're involved in, look, essentially every seed that a farmer wants, but uh, maize and beet uh, are obviously very important crops in, on, on livestock farms, and look, it, th th there's a lot of decisions to be made about those this time of the year as well. So we're doing a maize and beet webinar for an hour next Wednesday, so it's, it's Wednesday the 16th, and it's at 11, 11 a.m. to 11 a.m. to 12, 12 noon. Uh, we'll advertise that and we'll also send a link out to everyone who's here today. So if you want to sign up for that. And again, we'll again cover all the, the kind of main points. And I'll have Kieran Collins from, from Chagas joining me to kind of discuss the crops in terms of agronomy and in terms of how they fit and in terms of costings, particularly with the change scenario with, with, with fertilizer prices. So with that, I'd, I'd like to, to thank my speakers, James, and, and particularly Kieran, giving us the farm angle and things. And also Pat, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending and we leave it at that. Okay, bye-bye now.